Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. My name is uh, Diego Barletta. I am an associate professor of chemical engineering at the University of Salerno, and I'm presently the chairman of the working party on mechanics of particular solids. So it's my pleasure to welcome you in this uh, spotlight talks uh, this uh, afternoon on handling of particulate solids. Before starting, uh, I will uh, I introduce uh, the president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering, Hermann Pfizer, who will give you uh, a few words of introduction. Thank you, Diego. Yes, welcome everybody to this uh, webinar of our Spotlight Seminar Series. As the president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineers, I'm very proud of this event and of the 11 technical groups that we have that have taken on the challenge of delivering such sessions, three, four talk sessions virtually on the various subjects of chemical engineering, which we cover. And with the registrations we received, and we, we can see that this is actually a good addition to the scientific communication and collaboration that EFCE tries to initiate and to foster as part of its service to the more than 100,000 chemical engineers we represent in about 30 countries um, all over Europe and beyond. Um, the working parties and sections, they are the core of what we do. And I'm myself a proud honorary member of this working party on mechanics of particulate solids. I'm very pleased that we have this seminar today. Um, I'd like to take the, ch take the chance as well to thank Martine and Ines who have done all the hard work in setting up this series and both vanished from my screen, but I hope they're still here and can hear the thanks. And with that, I wish us all a very good, a very interesting webinar on the handling of bulk solids. Thank you very much, uh, Herman, for the very nice uh, introduction. So we go directly to, the, uh, to introduce uh, the talks for this uh, afternoon. And uh, basically, we uh, have a, a focus on some of the uh, important issues relevant to the application in which, uh, in industry, in which particular solids are present. And uh, in particular, we focus on a different aspects that may uh, affect uh, quite seriously the reliability of industrial processes dealing with the particulate solids. We will cover in particular three different aspects. The first one is related to biomass that are more and more present in the transformation industry as a renewable source. Then we will move on particular phenomena like the caking of cohesive powders. And finally, we will end with the segregation of particles with different characteristics. Uh, I can uh, say that uh, the presentation uh, will be all uh, recorded. Uh, during the presentation, you can type uh, uh, your question in uh, the dedicated space uh, in uh, this uh, Zoom uh, webinar. And so we will uh, uh, dedicate some time at the end of each talk uh, to try to answer to uh, some of the questions uh, arising from, from, the, from the audience. With these, I want to introduce uh, the first speaker, that is uh, Mike Bradley, that is Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Director of the Wolfson Center for Bulk Solids Handling Technology at the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom. So, and uh, the, the talk uh, delivered by Mike will be on biomass. So it is my pleasure to leave the floor to Mike. Thank you, Diego. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming and taking the time to, to listen. So yes, the, um, uh, today I'll be talking as uh, Diego mentioned about uh, biomass and the, uh, the challenges that we have with biomass. So let me just uh, select the right one here. Which one is it? I seem to have two open, it's this one. Share. Uh, okay, let me go back to the top. That would be a good place to start, wouldn't it? Uh, 
For some reason, it's not moving. So come out of that. No, I don't seem to be able to. Uh, let me just stop sharing again, see if I can try this again. We practiced this for half an hour beforehand, and of course, it all worked <laughs> perfectly, didn't it? Inevitably, things are uh, not so uh, not so easy. Now uh, we're actually trying to make it happen. We'll try again. Okay, we, we can see your PowerPoint uh, window, so you can just put in sure. presentation mode and uh, it should be okay. Right, hopefully you can see this. Yes. So those of you from America will know what the, uh, what the acronym SNAFU means. It's uh, something widely used in the American military. Situation normal, all fouled up. And this is uh, what we see with biomass handling plants. At the Wolfson Center, we do a lot of design and troubleshooting of uh, systems as well as research. And uh, I would say uh, the biomass re revolution has come with a lot of problems. So the kind of things I'll be talking about uh, is based on our experience of many, many biomass projects that have come uh, on stream in the last 15 years or so, large and small. Lots of stuff has been learned. None of uh, some of these uh, learnings were not unexpected. Um, I think the biggest learning, and again, this was not unexpected by those who know about bulk solids handling, is that serious and expensive problems are commonplace with biomass. And it's usually with the materials handling, more, much more so than the actual conversion process. So question is why and what can we do to reduce these technical risks? So subjects I'll be touching on today include dust, flow behavior, fire, explosion, ash handling, and just summing up some keys to success if you want to promote a biomass project. So why is it that most of these biomass projects suffer problems? Um, the fact is most biomass projects start with an idea in the lab or some trials in the lab, taking some small, small sample of material, processing it in a test tube, gasifying it, liquefying it, whatever. And then, of course, when it comes to scale up, the project promoter wants to go out and build this. They usually give the job to the cheapest tenderer. And that's where the problem arises, because usually the person who puts in the cheapest tender for building the plant is the one who is ignorant of the problems. And unfortunately, the, uh, the buyer generally is also equally ignorant. So kind of problem areas we've commonly seen, dust, as I said, I, I mentioned, self-heating, fire, uh, issues to do with quality, especially in pellets, uh, deaths and injuries from asphyxiation and intoxication, it, difficulties with fat stores, but there's been successes as well, uh, big improvements in transfer point design, uh, use of large storage silos, integrated means for dust control and fire control. So I'll be highlighting some of these success areas as well. Now, the question is, of course, what is biomass? People often talk about biomass as a material, but it's not. Biomass is as many different materials as there are projects. It ranges from uh, the one end sewage to uh, the other end wood pellets, and then you've got waste materials, anything that grows. Uh, biomass is a huge range of different things. So we need to think about what our biomass is going to be and how it's going to behave before we set out on a project. So we're talking about a classification system a bit later on. But I'm going to talk, start with dust because dust has proved to be the most persistent and difficult problem to combat, especially with dry biomass. Things like wood pellets, reclaimed waste wood, these kind of things. And these dust levels can be high, can be made worse by segregation and by particle breakage and handling as well. And what we found is that um, any given biomass stream, even if it's material to the same specification, can be highly variable in its dust properties. So the kind of key dust hazards, obviously health, explosion, risk, mess. Um, in terms of health, biomass dust is much more troublesome than other types of dust. From a health perspective, it's more mobile compared with coal dust. It stays suspended better, but it generates a much greater health danger because with biomass dust, you invariably have mold spores. 
And mold spores can give you this problem known as farmer's lung, which is extremely debilitating. So we need to stop people breathing biomass dust. So where does this occur? Think places like transfer points. Uh, one of the issues that we often find is the lack of containment over things like transfer points. Um, people often will turn to extraction, but extraction is not very effective if containment is not very good. I would say dust extraction is the last thing you need. That is to say you need to do everything to reduce and contain the dust first before you turn to extraction. But a lot of people don't see it that way because if they've got a dust problem, what do they do? They ring up a dust extraction company. And of course, it's in their interest to maximize the size of the extraction system. Uh, and the necessity with most biomass materials we're avoiding wet methods because they can give rise to fires. So shoot designs is something I wanna talk a little bit about. And uh, a big advance is uh, that were made, uh, particularly in Australia in shoot design over the last 20 years, have uh, proved to be very useful. And we widely applied these in biomass projects, what we call hood and spoon transfer points. Um, the idea being that where the material comes off the belt, instead of just letting it hit the other side of the transfer point and drop onto the belt where it tumbles backwards, you have a shaped uh, hood that intercepts a trajectory, cradles the material as it runs round, and then, and then comes down into a spoon on the bottom that projects it onto the belt neatly. And uh, this technology, as I said, uh, was not widely used in Europe before biomass came along. Um, but we found that this is uh, very effective, especially with wood pellets and such like, and we've often used this on projects with very good effect. Um, so here's an example. This is on Tilbury Power Station. Tilbury Power Station was originally a coal-fired power station, converted to wood pellets, and they had massive, massive dust problems. And this was a retrofit to give a, uh, a, a, a spoon design here for loading the belt, which made a huge, huge difference to the amount of dust on the floor in the transfer points, reduced the cleaning by a factor of 10. So very important lesson here with dusty biomass materials. Another big issue with dusty biomass materials, should we use open conveyors or closed conveyors? There are pros and cons to both. If you enclose the conveyor completely, you get less dust emission, but it's harder to clean. And the dust, what's more, builds up out of sight, which then makes a high explosion risk. So open conveyors by comparison, easier to clean, less explosion risk, but you get more dust out. One of the things we found to be very good is air supported conveyors. Uh, they have many advantages, especially when you're handling dusty biomass materials, and I would thoroughly recommend them. Uh, and another important uh, uh, factor is design of the stilling chamber, such as you see on the left here, to reduce the dust emission, uh, reduce, to settle the dust, basically, before the material comes out on the belt. And again, there's been quite a lot of research in Australia about that. Use it. It really works. Uh, heating in transfer points is something that came along unexpectedly in impact zones after long drops. We found uh, biomass has a unique ability to generate heat but not take it away uh, in impact points because of its low thermal conductivity. And we've recorded temperatures as high as 100 degrees or even more on transfer points in impact zones. This obviously is a fire and heating hazard. So therefore, um, we've learned lessons about that. And this blindsided everybody. Uh, large or very large silos for storage have proved to be somewhat troublesome. Um, obviously, one of the things about biomass, most biomass materials needs to be kept covered because it's moisture sensitive. So therefore, large silos and especially domes and such like lend themselves very well. But the problem is, while they may be OK for storage and discharge, we have issues with self-heating because large mm -hmm. piles don't lose their heat very well and also sizing of explosion vents. Uh, so this has been uh, a, a tough thing to overcome. In terms of self-heating and fire, many biomass materials self-heat, especially if they're biologically active. Things like brewers spent grain, uh, municipal waste, these kind of things, and in large stores that heat stays in there and can cause a fire. Wood pellets also, even though they're not biologically active, have been shown to be uh, substantial uh, problems with uh, self-heating. And there's a lot known about this. A lot of work has been done about this and needs to be taken account of. But one of the key things that we've learned is with biomass plants, if you're, um, you need to be prepared for fire. 
it's not a question of if you have a fire, it's only a matter of when. If you have a biomass plant, sooner or later, you will have a fire in that. So we've learned a lot about how not to fight silo fires. Uh, the one thing you mustn't do is uh, tear it open at the top and let the air in. Um, by comparison, the value of inert gas injection has been shown very strongly. This was Avador Power Station in Denmark, where they had uh, uh, an overheating incident in two very large, multiple thousands of tons uh, wood pellet silos. Um, uh, the large silo had gas injection facilities, so they, they brought in nitrogen gas, managed to, uh, to, to put out the fire, cool it, recover the pellets. The other silo was, uh, I think, still 5,000 tonnes, although it was a smaller one. They had no gas injection facility. It was a total loss. So the ability to be able to inject inert gas is something that uh, uh, is uh, extremely effective. Detection of fire also, CO is not adequate, we recommend uh, a more sophisticated gas analyzer. But do believe warnings because often people have uh, have warnings from gas analyzers, looked in the top of the silo, couldn't see anything, thought it was a false alarm. Same thing again a couple of times, they think it's a false alarm, then a day later they've got a fire. So do believe the warnings that you get from gas analysis. And what we've come up with at the Wolfson Centre after studying this at length is an integrated plan for silo fire protection. And there's uh, a number of points here. If you install all of these uh, on your silo, then you've got a very good chance that you'll be able to prevent and deal with fires. Any of these missing, you will find that a fire can run away from you. So uh, if you want more information about that, I can provide that. So size and explosion vents on large stores. Uh, these big domes at Drax Power Station here, which we had a, a heavy involvement with. If you size the explosion vents in the traditional way, by assuming that the whole dome can be filled with a dust cloud at an explosive concentration, there is not enough surface area on the dome for all the vents that you need, the vent area you calculate. So we have to work with a reduced volume dust cloud. Uh, and that, of course, is, uh, brings an interesting challenge of how big a dust cloud do we use? Uh, so again, quite a bit of research has been done on that, which has moved us in, in the right direction. Uh, deaths from asphyxiation and intoxication have become quite uh, legendary, especially with wood products, uh, wood chip, uh, wood pellets especially. So anywhere where wood pellets are stored, and this includes not only silos, um, bunkers, storage rooms, but also holds of ships and so on. You must keep people out and make sure that uh, they're well ventilated if anybody's going in there because quite a number of deaths have occurred. And this continues to this day. Uh, in spite of dust uh, control, uh, there is still always a need for housekeeping and particularly keeping dust off the floor. If you have a small event, you may have what we call a primary explosion which may be uh, not that big an event. But if there's dust on the floor, then that's raised into the air, that joins a party and uh, gives you a much bigger secondary explosion. And uh, how much dust on the floor is too much? Basically a millimeter, one thirty-second of an inch or thereabouts. Anything more than about that will give you an explosible concentration if it's raised into the air. So you need to keep biomass facilities clean if they're gonna be safe. This is an example of a secondary explosion. This, as it happens, this wasn't a biomass plant, this was a sugar plant. But uh, this uh, uh, utter destruction here was initiated by a small event in a conveyor, but because there was dust on the floor throughout the whole factory, the whole place was destroyed, 13 people died. So keeping dust off the floor is extremely important, especially places like under belts, uh, anywhere where there is, uh, is, is open material, there will be dust. Um, keeping heat sources clean. Uh, heat sources have often been found to be sources of fires, and that uh, takes me on to temperature rating of electric equipment in dusty areas. Big fire here at Tilbury Power Station uh, in 2013. $50 million this fire cost, and that was because they had some lamps that uh, collected wood pellet dust on the top, and started to smolder and the smoldering embers fell into an open bunker and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So 
uh, avoiding heat sources that can ignite dust, extremely important, especially with wood pellet dust or dust from reclaimed wood, dust from straw, or any dry biomass materials, very, very sensitive to ignition by heat sources. So the importance of cleaning, uh, if you go to a large biomass handling facility, Drax Power Station in the UK, for example, they have a crew of 20 people doing nothing but cleaning. And they collect between them nearly 10 tonnes of dust every day. 10 tonnes of dust. That's a lot of dust. But that's what you need to do to avoid a secondary explosion. Uh, they've had uh, on quite a few large plants, we've seen a number of uh, primary explosions, but that have not caused secondary explosions simply because there wasn't dust on the floor. And I cannot overemphasize the need for keeping dust off the floor above all else. All other considerations of ATEX and desire and explosion protection and what have you, uh, they're important, but they're not as important as keeping dust off the floor. So uh, contain dust, minimize dust, use extraction, uh, dry clean. Don't clean biomass wet. It makes the problem worse. It makes everything sticky. It goes moldy. Uh, it's a big problem. So uh, use of good quality PPE for staff, uh, training of staff, all of these things are extremely important. If they're not done properly, you won't get a good cleaning job. Now, the other thing uh, I'll, uh, I'm just going to introduce a little bit because I'm going to talk in a minute or two about flow of biomass. But don't forget, when you've got a, uh, a biomass combustion or um, treatment uh, processing facility, you've usually got ash or char. And most people forget the biomass ash doesn't behave like coal ash. So many, many issues have been caused because um, changing from coal to biomass, the ash wouldn't flow. So take care of that very carefully. Um, some pictures here, uh, ash blowing. Uh, one of the key things very often we find that biomass ash will not flow in dense phase as coal ash would. So therefore uh, conversion to lean phase uh, or um, some people uh, use some rather expensive alternatives of something like 200 skips, not uh, very effective. So storage and discharge has proved also to be a very challenging issue with many biomass materials. And again, this brings me back to the fact that biomass is many different materials, all of which have different flow properties. Some are exceedingly difficult to get to flow. Some are quite easy. Some spoil and self-heat. So therefore, very important to, to choose your storage and discharge equipment carefully. And one of the key enablers in getting this right is this biomass classification system, which we introduced in 2004. Uh, three classes of biomass materials, rounded particles free flowing, what we call class one, cohesive particles class two, and extreme shape particles class three. So class one are, for instance, materials like pellets, chunky wood chips, and so on. They behave like any other free flowing bulk solid. Then you've got sticky cohesive materials. This is olive waste here. That's again, pretty much like any other cohesive bulk solid. You have to treat it in the same way you would wet coal or wet iron ore or something like that. And then we have this much more interesting class, which a lot of raw biomass materials fall into. Ground wood, uh, chopped straw, all of these sort of things. These have long flaky particles that nest together. And it's very difficult to get these to flow. These are what we call the class three materials. So important to choose flow patterns, for instance, in uh, silos uh, for these different materials have different requirements. Core flow silos, where you have first in, last out. Take material out of the bottom, it doesn't flow on the wall. You get a flow channel through the middle. Now you can use that for class one materials, but because this is first in, last out, you have to be very careful about self-heating not very good for class two materials and useless for class three materials. Mass flow by comparison, where material flows on the wall when you take material out, gives you first in, first out discharge. So that will take care of self-heating. And you can use that for class two materials as well as class one, but generally not for class three materials. For class three materials, we're generally stuck with uh, having to use something, something else, which I'll come on to in a minute. But the other thing is, very important to look at the details of feeder design. Even if you get your silo design right, if the feeder design is not right, if you don't have progressive capacity, as shown on the right, <coughs> it 
if you use, for example, a constant pitch screw, <coughs> pardon me, this will give you lots of problems in handling. And the majority of people do this wrong. We see this, we see many more badly designed than well designed feeders, often causing a lot of problems. So what can we use for class three biomass? Things like these raw materials, straw, sawdust, cut grass, sheet waste materials, these sort of things, core flow, no good. Uh, generally, we're talking about a full live bottom discharger, material, a bin that has a discharge from across the whole of the bottom of it. Or alternatively, flat stores and mobile plants. But these bring their own problems, although they're good for these class three materials. And they're widely used for class one and class two materials as well, because the investment is low, they're quick to build, uh, flexible, you don't need any piling. The labor intensity, the dust, the safety issues arising from that, inhalation, fires, these kind of things prove to be pretty challenging. And just keeping the equipment clean is a huge burden. Another strong lesson plan for the long term. Changing your raw material portfolio is a given. So you must allow space to change things in the equipment if the material demands it. Uh, a number of years ago, we published a best practice guide here for handling of biomass fuels. If anybody wants a copy, drop me a line or drop um, Martina line. She'll pass it on and uh, I'll send you a copy. And there's also, uh, I recommend if you are dealing with uh, ATEX issues, which we normally are with biomass materials, there's a very good guide here published by Sharper, Solid Handling and Processing Association in the UK. Again, drop me a line if you want a copy of that. So what challenges are there going forward? Still difficult to achieve satisfactory safety levels on many biomass plants. Changing the fuel physical characteristics also is very much an ongoing thing. A lack of standardization, and even when materials are prepared against the specification, they vary greatly. And of course, changes in regulatory policy are gonna make a huge difference. If there's one lesson to learn, this goes for any bulk solids handling, any, any uh, process that uses bulk solids, but especially for biomass. You must plan to spend money studying the handling properties of the material at an early stage, whether we're talking about flow properties, dusting, self-heating, segregation, attrition, any of these other things, and they must be taken account of in selecting the equipment and the suppliers. And of course, this costs more money than most project promoters expect. They expect this to be done uh, pretty much for free by the equipment suppliers in most cases. But that doesn't work. Because most people go out and buy the cheapest thing, remember the words of Henry Ford. There's always somebody willing to do it cheaper, but at what cost? The cheapest plant will often cost you the most money to run and retrofit. Spend the money up front, characterizing the material, choosing the right plant. And find the people who are gonna do that. And they'll charge you for this, and that's uh, to be expected. But uh, as Red Adair, the famous oil well firefighter said, if you think it's expensive to hire a professional to do a job, wait until you try hiring an amateur. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mike, uh, for uh, the very nice overview on the biomass uh, issues. And um, of course, there are um, a lot of open issues to work on. And this is uh, nice for the community, of course, and not uh, very good news for the uh, practitioner. But uh, by the way, problems uh, need engineers to, to, to solve them. So it's OK this way. Um, I have one question um, about uh, uh, the fact that the start-up and shutdown uh, of plants uh, may be the, criti the very critical moment uh, in the uh, plant operation. What are the, the peculiarity with respect to, to the problems uh, you um, illustrated related to dust explosion, for example, or uh, uh, the, 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 the handling in, in general of biomass related to this particular moment? Very good question, Diego, and uh, glad you raised that because, of course, as we all know, in many continuous processing plants, the startup and shutdown transients are often troublesome to us in many ways in terms of material quality and so on. 
one of the biggest problems with biomass is time dependency of the material because when you shut the plant down a lot of these materials a lot of these biomass materials will settle and compact or they'll self-heat and when you leave them in uh, static storage of course then they tend to change uh, when you then try and start to run the plant you'll have the problem you'll have either excessively hot material coming through or wet material or something like that material that's difficult to get to flow so the time dependency of biomass materials is, is particularly troublesome I think it's fair to say in startup and shutdown transients. Thank you very much Mike. So I invite all the attendees, if they have a question, to put them in the dedicated chat. In this way, I can uh, put them uh, so, to, the, uh, to the speaker. So I have just one. Um, why shouldn't we uh, use wet dust uh, uh, when uh, we clean dust? Electrostatic force and surface force normally make dust stick to the equipment surface. And maybe after wet, wetting dust, it would be easy to remove. Yes, this is a very good. Uh, this is a very good question, and this is an area where a lot of people come into problems with uh, biomass plants because the traditional approach with a coal handling plant, of course, when you've got a lot of dust, you get the fire hose out, you hose it all down, and then you just let it settle on the floor for a few days and then shovel it up once it's dried. But with biomass, unfortunately, that doesn't work because most biomass dust it dusts. Um, by their very nature, are absorbent of water. So what happens when the dust, when you wet the dust, what happens, yes, initially, it may, it may start to cause it uh, where, where you've actually washed it with water, it will move. But the problem is where material is, that is getting just sort of sprayed uh, or misted or picking up water through the humidity, the problem is that the surface gets damp and when the surface is damp, it sticks, but then the moisture is absorbed into the, into the particle. So any soluble material that is associated with it, of which there is usually some, then cakes and it bind, binds the material to the surface. The other problems with uh, cleaning biomass wet is that because it makes it stick and then it's wet, it then goes moldy over a period of time. And when it goes moldy, of course, the mold spores are in the wet material, but over a period of time, the material dries out. When it dries out, people walk through it, vehicles drive through it, it falls off and the mold spores are released. And when you breathe these mold spores, this can give you this problem of farmer's lung, which is a very common, uh, uh, becoming a very common claim for industrial injury. Uh, the other problem is with biomass material, because it soaks up water, if you have biomass material on steps or something like that that gets wet, when you step on it, it's like stepping on a sponge. The, the water squeezes out and then you aquaplane and you're more likely to go down the steps on your back. So therefore, from, from every safety viewpoint, it's best to avoid wet cleaning with biomass dust. Okay, we have uh, some other question. Uh, should biomass intermediates, uh, such as lignin, be processed like biomass or normal solids? Oh, oh. <laughs> now there's an interesting question. Obviously, it depends very much upon the material. Um, biomass, in many ways, you could say is like an, like an ordinary bulk solid. It's just that it has certain specific properties. All bulk solids have, have specific properties. Um, so it really depends upon... I guess the key things here, one of, the, one of the big issues with biomass, as I said, is particle shape. If you've got extreme shape particles, then they're problematic. So look at the particle shape, look at, ask the same questions. Will it break down and form dust? Uh, will it self heat and cause fire? Uh, is it likely to nest and entangle? So I think really for, for all bulk solids, you should be asking these same questions. Doesn't matter whether they're raw materials, intermediates or finished products. That's good. So also related to particle size, uh, this is the, the final question for now, then uh, we will have uh, some additional time at the end of all the, the, the talks. What are the methods to improve the flowability of biomass, uh, which have a uh, long aspect ratio? Hmm. Well, the key thing is to reduce the aspect ratio. 
we've uh, we've we've found uh, some work done by a PhD student of mine some time ago. Basically, found that uh, the critical aspect ratio is between two and three. If you have an aspect ratio less than two to one, then generally speaking, you will not get a nesting entangling problem. When you get a when you get an aspect ratio more than three, you will get this this entangling problem. And there's really nothing much you can do about it. It's not like you can treat the surface. You know, if you have a cohesive powder, you can dust the surface with a flow aid, for example. But that doesn't help you here because it's the natural shape of the particles. So the only way to overcome it really is to improve the, uh, the aspect ratio or to select equipment that will deal with the entangling. Very good point. So uh, I would uh, move uh, to the next speaker if Mike can wait uh, to, to get some additional questions at the end. Okay. Thank you very much. And so my next speaker uh, is uh, Jairo Padronina, who is a senior consultant uh, at Jenica Johansson in the uh, United States of America. And uh, his talk uh, will be about uh, the caking of powders in product bags uh, during transport. So please, Jairo, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Diego. Let me just uh, present my screen. Let me see if you can, um, okay. So yeah, caking of powders in product uh, bags during transport, um, very common problem uh, for many people, for many companies, for many products. Uh, first of all, just a brief introduction of our company. Uh, Jenny Can Johansson is specialized engineering firm providing solutions in powder and bulk solid storage, handling, conveying, and processing. We were incorporated in the 60s by Dr. Andrew Jenicki. Uh, we have offices in five countries, USA, Canada, Brazil, Chile, and Australia. In the US, we have three offices. Uh, our headquarters where I'm sitting right now is in Massachusetts. Uh, we have worked with many, many uh, people around the world and we have tested as well or characterized the behavior of many granular materials uh, over all these years. Uh, an outline of the presentation for today is a short presentation. It's only you know less than 30 minutes. So it's short for caking, but let's try to do it. First, let's uh, try to find a definition for what is caking. Then let's talk about some key aspects to consider during storage and transport. Uh, a little bit about caking mechanism. We are going to talk about uh, that as well. And uh, if we have some time, we'll, we'll discuss briefly about tests that you can run to characterize the caking behavior of your material so you can find solutions uh, for that. So first of all, what is caking? Uh, caking is really an intended agglomeration of your granular material and is due to the formation of a strong cohesive forces between the particles that keep them together and then it generates lumps or rocks uh, and many other different names that uh, people can give to this uh, phenomena. Uh, but rather than focusing on, on the technical definition of it, let's, let's try to define it on the consequences uh, that it can create. Uh, for instance, in this photo that you're seeing, is just a compound material or compound chemical material that is used to produce many plastic products. So this is just at the discharge of a, a, a flexible uh, container or a ball bag or super sack. Uh, so you're discharging this and then it's supposed to be very fine material, but instead you find these uh, basketball or soccer uh, balls there uh, plugs everything in your plan. Uh, likewise, you can have the caking not only in super sack or bulk bags, but also can be in 25 kilos uh, bags or even smaller bags. It really doesn't respect the size of the bags. It can form in any place. As in this photo, this is a 25 kilo bag of a food ingredient 
and it's supposed again to be um, powder, but instead you have it um, as rocks. And it can also be not only small rocks, but humongous rocks, like the size of the, the whole uh, ball barrel super sack. In this case, I'm showing you um, uh, the warehouse of uh, fertilizer uh, plant. And I'm surprised these people were able to, uh, you know, discharge these from the super sacks, these boulders of cake material. So some quotes and um, when you are experiencing this caking and of course, as you can imagine, if you ship this material to your customer and he received these boulders or rocks and it's supposed to be a granular material, the first thing you're gonna have is a immediate complaint, right? And uh, things like sometimes the product flows well and other times it doesn't, the uh, competition product always flows well. So this is the first statement that you normally will have. And uh, you know, it, uh, your customer can take advantage of, of it from the uh, cost standpoint of, of your material, but also it immediately affects, you know, your market share. It could, it could have big implications uh, just because of this. Another quote can be some ball bags are case so hard that we cannot uh, uh, even unload the material. So we need to uh, break them up by ramming against the wall. Uh, another one, some ball containers are taking excessive time to unload and it is costing us, uh, us too much money. Or some badges are full of agglomerates that don't dissolve, I'm sure. Uh, for some of you that are uh, participating in this talk, you may um, you may be familiar with one of those uh, quotes, especially if you are trying to solve a caking issue um, in your in your facility. So, at the end of the day, what is really caking is is a quality problem. It's a big problem, and it really doesn't respect whether you have the best technology to produce any material at the end of the day, the face is of, of your plan is really your the product. And it's not at the end of your process, it's really by the time your customers receive your material. That's how it is, or that's how you are evaluated at the end of the day. So it's a big quality problem. It creates big headaches at the other end at your customer site, as you can see in this photo, even if you are able to unload the material from the bags and you are further processing it for your own, your customer process, then it can block everything. And, and this picture that we normally use when we are uh, uh, presenting courses in solid flow, like Michael did, um, is a typical picture of people is just banging on the sides of of hoppers just because the material doesn't flow, but in this case, it's because it's all caked up. Uh, so some key aspects to consider uh, with regards to, to caking. Uh, this is, the, these three aspects that I'm putting here are perhaps uh, the most important ones when dealing with uh, material that are especially sensitive to moisture and, and temperature uh, which is most of the cases when you are experiencing caking problem. Also time, caking is, is a time phenomenon. So you need time for a particular cake to develop during a storage. That means if you keep, for instance, your material, uh, your granules um, in motion, you're not gonna experience caking, but as soon as you put them at rest and you package them either in bulk bags small bags, now they are at rest, they can be under pressure and, and for a long time. So if you put this on a chart and you put the temperature relative humidity on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis, and you follow, for instance, in this case, the purple line, which is the temperature, you, you can see the temperature really, especially if your product is not handled under control ambient conditions, which is most of the cases. 
you can you can see that this is this can vary widely, uh, really uh, during the storage in the bags. The same for relative humidity, which is the blue line. So at packaging in your process facility, uh, which is typically very short time that you, if you have especially a low inventory in your plant, the time that the material stays at your plant is probably, you know, a couple of days, a week or so in your warehouse at the plant, where maybe the uh, ambient conditions are not varying that widely. So no wonder why you don't perhaps see the caking problems at your facility, and maybe not even with the material that you're retaining at your facility. However, when you start transporting your material, let's say it's going overseas in ship containers or um, um, on train in uh, rail wagons or any other type of transportation, the bus can see very wild um, um, temperature uh, or ambient conditions and it, and it can vary tremendously from day to night. And not only that, as you can see in this chart, uh, opposed to only a week that the material is spent at your plant, in this case, when you are transporting, especially overseas, you're talking about 30 days, 45 days, 90 days or more time uh, where, where your material is gonna be sitting at this condition. And then finally, it reaches your customer, right? And at your customer side, most of the time you really don't know, it can be even worse, the conditions that with your material is exposed. So that's something to keep in mind when you are trying to solve a caking problem. Uh, another um, good aspect about it is how you store your material in your warehouse. So many times uh, you, you can have this question whether if you stock uh, one high bag or two high bags, is it matter really? Is it, uh, it, is, it is, you may see it as a naive question, but it's, it's a very important question because you want to save space in your warehouse, especially if you are handling, um, you know, high inventory. Uh, for any reason, or if you are putting your bags in a ship container, you want to maximize the volume uh, that you can use in that ship container, right? So you may, you know, the tendency is to stack up as much as you can. However, caking can be sensitive to pressure. The more pressure you apply, the more caking you can face. So instead of stacking the bags one on top of the other, you may be forced to have some racks and, and only have one row pallets uh, to minimize the pressure. Another important aspect to consider is um, the barrier, your package wall. So it's not that if you have a bag and it's perfectly sealed, then you are out of the woods with respect to caking. If you, especially if your material is very sensitive to the ambient relative humidity. Keep in mind that any bags, any plastic film will have some permeation uh, to moisture, to oxygen, to CO2, CO2 from um, the ambient. So in this uh, sketch on the left side, you will have a lot of water molecules can be you know, an ambient of high relative humidity. Then it will diffuse through the bag at some rate. And if your material is very sensitive to moisture, then uh, it could be a matter of a week or a matter of you know, one month at which your material can be exposed to these high relative humidity conditions just for the moisture to permeate enough uh, to cause problems in your product. And just as an example, these um, property of a, a three mils high, high, high density polyethylene bag, uh, which is called uh, water vapor transmission, can be easy from two to three grams of water per square meter per day, measure at 38 Celsius degrees and 90% average. So 
if you have, let's say a super sack of about, you know, say five square meter of surface in the bag, that can equate to quite some grams of water per day. And um, if you do the, the math, you can realize how uh, important is to recognize what exactly is the protection that the bag is offering uh, to your product. So another important aspect is temperature induced moisture migration. This relates to the fact that when let's say your crystals are coming from the dryer at 60, 50 or 40 Celsius degrees, you package them and then you put it in your warehouse uh, that can be around 20, 25 Celsius degrees. So one issue here is that the temperature induces moisture migration. That means even if your material is uniformly dried and the moisture content can be very low, and I'm talking a um, fraction of, of a percent, let's say uh, 0.05%. So even if it is like that, because of these temperature differences, uh, you induces uh, some movement of moisture from the particles to the gas phase and from the gas phase due to these uh, temperature differences, you will move the moisture to the uh, cold areas. And because of that, you can concentrate um, all the moisture that was uniformly distributed initially to one single spot. And then you can have uh, the caking issues starting in that area. And this is especially true uh, when you have, I'm showing now on your right hand side, the, what is called absorption isotherm, which is um, in equilibrium, how much the moisture content of your material when you expose it sufficiently time to reach equilibrium at a certain activity or relative humidity of the environment. In this case, activity is just a relative humidity expressed as a fraction. So divided by 100. And let's say that in this case, your material can easily cake if it reaches uh, a relative humidity in between the particles inside the bag at 0 0.5 or 50% average in between the particles. So if it reaches that, you have recognized that it can start caking. And you can see in the y-axis that you don't need to uh, move too much moisture really to reach that condition of which it cakes is less than 0.05% in this case. So it's very, very little. So uh, uh, just to show an example of this problem, uh, this is just a simulation um, using Comsol Multiphysics uh, just to evaluate moisture migration. So let's assume uh, for a moment that you have a ball bag like this and you can represent that domain by um, a cylinder, you know, is, is, is a good representation because it, even though the bag might be square or rectangular, um, the cross section really, when you feel it, it can, can bow the walls and then adopt more or less a cylinder. So I think it's good. And let's assume that the initial temperature coming from the dryer and packing this is relatively hot, um, 60 degrees C, probably a little bit hot, but good to uh, illustrate the issues. And let's assume also the ambient condition is at 20 degrees C and this is sitting on the floor and the floor is um, 18 degrees C. Again, just to show uh, the motion migration induced by uh, temperature differences. So uh, after three hours here on your left, you see um, a surface plot of the relative humidity in between the particles. And on your right, you see the temperature and the moisture flux inside. So the direction uh, of movement of moisture um, in that domain. And then you see the uh, legend, the color legends. One is showing the temperature and the other one is showing the relative humidity inside the bag in the gas phase in between the particles. 
So you see that after three hours, you can see the boundary of that bag because it's cooler on the outside. Uh, relative humidity will tend to rise over there. And that causes that the solids near the wall will start absorbing moisture. And then that causes at, at the end of the day, a difference in concentration in the gas phase between the core of your bag and the, and, and the material that is uh, touching the walls of, of your package. So the moisture will start moving to the sides of the bag, concentrating on the layers uh, near um, this, the, the walls of, of, of your bag, as you can see in this picture. And then as the time progresses, with the same boundary conditions of ambient, fixing the ambient to 20 and 18 at the bottom, you can see that this is just a progression. So uh, on the left, you can see the relative humidity in red is getting drier and drier and it's getting very dry. And then on the sides is getting uh, uh, wet. So now we have 70%, we started at 55%, and now we have 70% uh, um, near the wall, but it's, it's also growing. Before it was a layer, now it's, it's a thick, thicker layer. And then as the time passes, and let's say after 30 days, because the, the, the floor is cooler, uh, than really the ambient is two degrees cooler. In this case, you can see now that the moisture that was before trying to concentrate on all around the bag, now it's moving to the bottom. And you can see um, the relative humidity uh, plot on your left that you have more kind of bluish color, which means uh, the relative humidity is increasing and, and um, with time. So it's really a matter of time. Therefore, it's not only, and, and I receive many of these, um, often many of these comments from clients that, okay, even if I have that, my, the same material on the sides of the bag offers some type of additional protection because kind of absorb all that moisture. But in, in, in reality, it, it really, I wouldn't say that. It really depends on the conditions that with your back is exposed to. And as you can see here, even if you have small differences in temperature of the walls of the bag with respect to the bottom, you can really shift the moisture from one place to the other. And, and, and if you start thinking about, uh, if you are related to these caking problems, you see that many of the times when you find cakes in your bags, it's not only um, on the sides on, on immediately against the wall of your package. It can be really all around. And this can be an explanation um, of that. So if you run multiple times, uh, this type of simulation is starting from uh, different temperatures, you can create a plot on the white axis, for instance, you can see the solids moisture content. I'm plotting here just the maximum uh, moisture content on the left, and then the relative humidity in the gas phase in between the particles on your right. And, and a different initial temperatures of your material going into the bag, maintaining the same temperature of the ambient. So here you can see the progression of how much or how high the moisture content of your material and the relative humidity of the interparticles spaces can reach due to this difference in temperature created between the initial temperature of the material and the ambient temperature or your warehouse temperature. So if you run this again several times, you can realize, aha, uh -huh, so I probably will need to implement a cooling step in my process or, or dry it more, the, or dry more the material or something else to prevent um, reaching certain conditions of which you know previously that it can create uh, this caking um, problem. So let's talk about the caking mechanism. Um, 
there are several mechanisms and, and really each material is, so it's not like if you solve one caking problem, now you can solve any caking problem. Uh, it's really particular, it's very specific to um, each material. And therefore it can be, this topic can be um, a good topic for a PhD thesis. And that's why you find so many PhD theses about around uh, the world talking about caking of a specific, a very specific product. And it's because really when you are dealing with this problems, it can be so complex that uh, uh, it, it can really give a good subject for uh, an extent, extended um, study. Um, so that's also one of the challenges when you are dealing with uh, caking. But anyway, so talking about the mechanism, so we have interlocking bonding when you have high aspect ratio of your material, um, like Michael was uh, describing at the beginning, you can have also some type of caking because of that. Uh, dry solid cohesive forces, liquid forces or solid breaches, especially this is true with uh, moisture sensitive materials. And uh, you can also have a glass transition temperature if you have some uh, amorphous uh, organic materials like yeast, for example, um, is, it can be amorphous and so it becomes sticky as a function of temperature and that also can create caking. Uh, one, one of the most common mechanism, I would say maybe 90% of the cases, at least based on our experience, is really related to water in the material. So the moisture content or the relative humidity at which your material is exposed. Very common in powders or crystalline materials that are soluble in water. It can be a slight solubility or can be high solubility. Um, uh, it can also create this problem. So uh, what is really the mechanism? Well, it's really a function of uh, the conditions at, at which you are exposing your material. Um, if the relative humidity is, is low, so you probably will have just mono layers of water absorb with D as in David, absorb on the surface of your crystal or your uh, granular material. Then as the um, relative humidity increases, uh, you start having some liquid bridging. So you can have capillary condensation and this liquid bridging uh, acting as an, an additional cohesive force to keep your particles together. This enough, uh, this alone, sorry, can, um, make your material that used to be a nice, dry, granular material flowing very well. Um, even if you grab it in between your hands, it will just flow through your fingers. Uh, and uh, compared to if you have some liquid bridging, now you start seeing your material being kind of cohesive and difficult to flow. So if the relative humidity um, keeps increasing, you will reach a point that with uh, your material can start dissolving on the surface, as you can see in the photo on your right. Now, if because of this motion migration, for example, uh, the, the motion moves again or dry, you have um, motion moving from one place to another, and then uh, these uh, uh, liquid bridges, they, they have dissolved some of the material on the surface, then it, it dries out, it can recrystallize. And now instead of having a liquid uh, bridge joining the, or bonding the particles together, you will have a solid bridge and probably a very severe uh, caking problem. Some factors that are important to consider, um, and this is related to how you stack your product in your warehouse, in the ship containers uh, related to pressure. So the more pressure you apply, you will bring these particles to more intimate contact and you can even deform the contact points between the particles and increasing this particle-particle contact. So your material will become more sensitive to caking. Uh, at the same time, if you have fines, uh, um, if you have 
higher concentration of fines may be due to segregation. I assume Kerry Johansson will talk about this uh, segregation issues. But if you have, let's say one bag uh, full of fines and another bag that is, doesn't have that much of fines, uh, chances are that the bag that has more fines will see or will experience um, a higher probability of caking or will, you know, will behave differently when you open the bag uh, compared to the bag that doesn't have that much of, of fines in it. Uh, lastly, uh, there are many, again, there are many variables uh, that are involved in this, uh, with this cakey problem. And as I said initially, uh, moisture is one of the most important ones, ambient conditions, temperature, uh, relative humidity, are, uh, and of course time are perhaps the most important variables when you are dealing with, with a caking issue. Um, is most of the time it's not really practical uh, to just take your bag, put it in a warehouse for instance, put some pressure on it and just evaluate caking because as you can see, it's a, it's a time phenomenon. So it can take several weeks for you to get an answer. And even if you get an answer, uh, it might not be it's just an answer for that specific condition at which you put your material at. So you are not really characterizing uh, the effects of different variables on the caking behavior of your product. So a good way to do that is do a caking test and it can be, uh, you know, there are different type of uh, tests that some are uh, better than the others or, or let me put it in this way, some uh, are more usable for the specifics of your uh, material than others. But no matter what you use to characterize the caking behavior, what is important in your test is that first you can quantify the effects of variables to characterize the caking. And second, that you really know how to make the interpretation of what you're getting uh, from your test result. Here at Genike, uh, we use uh, the Genike uh, shear tester. Uh, if, if you want to know more about this uh, uh, testing, you can, it's an ASTM B6128. You can download that and uh, read a little more, or you can contact me about uh, to, to ask about this type of testing. But this is what we use. We use here, so basically it's, it's a cell. You put the specimen inside the cell, as you see in this picture, and then you apply a load, which can represent the load of your, um, of the that the material is seen when it's in the bag, and let's say if it is a super sack, a one ton super sack, you will apply uh, 10 kilopascals of pressure or something like that in this order. And you, you, you put this cell under pressure for some time. And the way you evaluate uh, the caking is after some time you take that cell and then you shear, you apply some pressure on the side here, you measure the shear force that you need to, um, to, to apply to, to, fail, to, to fail that specimen inside the cell. And you can measure these type of forces as a function of the pressure that you are applying. So at the end of the day, what you can um, get from this type of uh, cohesive strength test is a, what is called a flow function. It's a relation of the consolidation pressure that you apply on the material. Again, this can be representing the stacking forces on your product versus the strength of, 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 of the specimen or how strong is the cake that forms under specific conditions. And I'm showing here just a, a work that we are running right now. Um, it's a fine powder and you, uh, you see here that we can really quantify the effect of um, 
applying two types of pressure around 12 kilopascals and 18 kilopascals. This is probably representing either one row bag or super sack versus two super sacks, so one on top of the other. And you can see that we have evaluated this at different relative humidity conditions and time uh, arrest. And then there are um, conditions at which you don't see caking at all. But at those conditions where you see caking, you can see how important is the pressure. So this material is pressure sensitive. And this will kind of tell you that under the conditions of caking, if you are stacking two bags or two super sacks, it's probably gonna get worse versus if you just keep one row stacked. And I'm talking about just following the um, yellow curve on this picture. So um, that's all for today. If you have any questions, please, um, you can ask it now or you can contact me. Just uh, go to our webpage and you'll find me there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jairo, for uh, shedding some light on the, this uh, uh, very critical problem uh, that is caking. Uh, we have uh, one uh, question from the attendees. Uh, do you know if anyone uh, ever stores and ships their bags upside down? And if this helps by forming a cake uh, at top of the bag? <laughs> I, uh, I haven't heard about this kind of approach <laughs> before. Uh, but as I said, uh, when I was showing this simulation on how much I can move in the bags, it's not just that you know you accommodate the bag in different uh, positions. Um, if you if you put your bag, even if you don't put you know many bags on top, let's put it that way. If you have sufficient moisture available inside the bag, that that kind of moisture might migrate, and you are not controlling the environment conditions in that ship container, for instance, because it's cost prohibited, right? Not everybody has, or not every product has the luxury to be <laughs> ambientally controlled when you are shipping this material because it doesn't pay off, right? Uh, uh, it's too expensive. So the moisture can really migrate whether you put the bag, you know, in whatever position you want, but, you know, Depending, for instance, if you locate the bag near the wall, near the wall, or is on a on a wood pallet, or you know, there are there are things that um, just by positioning the bag can make a difference. But I would say, if you're trying to solve one a problem of caking and it's due to moisture, uh, do some testing, recognize the ambient conditions at which you are exp exposing your material. Uh, do this type of analysis of whether moisture can migrate to one place to the other. First, recognize at which conditions really your material wants to cake. What are those variables that create um, the caking issue? And then based on that, you can start now going to your process uh, to maybe do something with your dryer, or maybe do something with blanketing uh, the conveyors with dry air, or maybe if you cannot do anything and your material can accept some uh, flowing agents, probably that's the way to go. Uh, but, but the important thing is that there are ways to characterize this behavior of your material and you should do that first. Then you should do, do some type of analysis and then uh, uh, engineering work because Testing only probably give you, you know, 60% of, of, of the answers. But then after you test, you need to make the interpretation of the results. And now you will have the task of how to avoid those conditions in your material that uh, at which it cakes uh, during transportation. So um, yeah. Okay. Um... Another question is, uh, these slides concern caking issues of dry products. What about caking issues for initial wet materials 
when we make a natural dewatering of the product in big bags, at the end, we can give a good sandy product or a caking product. We have the same mechanism causes. Remember that I, I tried to define caking by the problem it can cause. So let's say even if you have wet material and it's very cohesive, it's a cake material. If that's the way the material is, like that's, that's, that's the material no matter what, and that's what your customer is expecting, probably will have the handling equipment to deal with this. You know, probably if you are shipping, let's say, ball bags, wet material in ball bags, the, the ball bag discharger probably will have some rams to massage this bag very with strong forces and you may have other means to just be able to unload that bag. So at the end of the day, if it is not a problem, you don't have a kicking problem. Yes, your material can still lump, can still be cohesive, but if your client can handle this and you don't have flooring in your plant because you designed for it, that's okay. You are not gonna have the complaint. The problem is when you have a dry material, you have your salt, you have your sugar that is supposed to be granular, free flowing. And then at the other end, after 90 days, when your customer sees this material, it's all caked up and it doesn't flow. That's when you have a caking problem. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Jairo. So uh, we have other questions. Maybe Jairo could try to, to answer directly in the, in the Q&A section or at the end. We are running uh, late, so we need to, to go on. I apologize for the delay. And so I would continue with the third uh, speaker. Uh, that is uh, Kerry Johansson, who is a Chief Operations Officer at Material Flow Solution in United States of America. And uh, the talk uh, by Kerry is prediction and mitigation of powder segregation in bulk handling system. Please Kerry, the floor is yours. Thanks Diego. Let me, uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so today what we're going to be talking about is segregation, and uh, that's a very important subject matter, and hopefully you can hear me. So the, uh, the segregation we're talking about is the segregation of uh, components or particle size segregation, and one of the questions that we'd like to ask is, uh, can you take the results of a segregation potential uh, test coupled with uh, an understanding of the flow properties of the, uh, of the material and a description of the process, and then use that to optimize the system geometry to, to minimize the segregation effects. So that's what we're gonna be talking about uh, today. If I can measure segregation, if I know the properties, can I, understand how we're going to get the segregation so they can change my process in some way, shape, or form. So here's what we need to do. We need to measure the uh, flow properties of the uh, mixture, the blend, the API, and that sort of thing. And then we need to measure the segregation potential of that blend and we're gonna to choose to use a spectral method. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. We need to know what uh, velocities, solid flow velocities are in the system. And from that, we're gonna borrow uh, some, some information from what's called the radial stress theory. We need to know the segregation profile. So we need to know what, what uh, profile we should expect in a piece of process equipment when we fill it and we will need to know what velocities are, are in that piece of equipment as we discharge it. Then we have to define uh, what's a reasonable range for content uniformity. We're, when you're dealing with a segregation issue, 
you're always dealing with the content uniformity question. How good is good? And so we need to define that. And then we'll, we'll compute the segregation that comes out of the system and, and ask the question, well, did it fall within those ranges? And there are a couple different things that we can do in terms of segregation. One, we've got a, a, a situation where sometimes the segregation and the system is you fill the bin or the process container and then you discharge it completely. Or sometimes what you're doing is you're running in more of a continuous mode and you're passing material through the system and then asking the question, does it segregate as a function of time? In both instances, you're, you're concerned about the function of time, but we'll deal with both the continuous and the fill and then complete discharge uh, in this conversation. So we're gonna measure the segregation potential. So you take and put the material into a cell to form a pile. We're gonna use NIR to measure the, the spectral regions along the pile. If those spectral, if that spectra is different, then we have a segregation problem. We're going to take and fill the component trays with pure, uh, pure components and measure the, the spectra, the reflectant spectra of those pure components. And then we'll use a nonlinear spectral mixing rules to compute the concentration of, those key, of the key components along the surface of the pile. Basically, we dump it into a box. Uh, we measure the reflectant spectra along the pile and if there's differences, there's segregation. We then compute the concentration along that, uh, along that box, and that gets us the profile and also the magnitude of the, uh, of the segregation problem that we have. So these are the component boxes that we use for the pure components. We form a pile in there, and, and we can control the feed rate and, and the drop height into that that box so we can get an understanding of how flow rate might affect things, how drop the drop size might affect things in terms of the segregation. We filter that line, we read that so that we know the where the pile is, <clears throat> and then we go ahead and form a measurement zone. We take the measurement zone so that it includes <clears throat> several layers of uh, that go down the pile. What we want to do is get a, a consistent measure of, uh, of the segregation. <clears throat> Once we've done that, then we select a, a area that we want to take a look at segregation. And it's not just one measure, measurement that we take, but we take a various different measurements within that <clears throat> up to 50 measurements along the pile and up to 49 different measurements within a selected area. And then we move the viewport box uh, up so that we get different measurements uh, along the pile. The net result is we get the segregation uh, reflected spectra of the pure components. In this case, it's a five component mix, and this is using visible in this case. And then we get the, the spectra, the reflectance spectra of the mixtures at various different points along the pile. And we use a least squares nonlinear method to go ahead and approximate that spectra. Once we have that information, we then have the concentrations of those various different components along the pile. And so at the end of the day, what we have is a concentration as a function of dimension, dimensionless radius. Zero is at the top of the pile and one is at the bottom of the pile. And you can see that in this particular case, we've got some of the components that do not vary very much at all. They, they have a, a uniform concentration across the pile. You have other components that change significantly as, as you go across the pile. And uh, that is the profile. And you can see that in some cases, we don't have very much segregation. With, in the case of the red pepper and dill, and dill seed in this case, but in the other case with the back, black pepper, you've got a great deal of segregation. So that allows us to get a segregation measurement. Now, this, we can also use this to get a uh, segregation by particle size. Uh, if you ask the question, why are clouds white? 
and then ask the other question, why when they rain, do they get gray? We find out it's all about the size of the water, water particles and the scattering of light from those particles. So that particular principle, when you shine a light on, onto any surface, it will reflect based on the size of the, of the particles that you have. And you get a, a more intense reflection spectra with the finer particles. And we can use that to our advantage. So what we can do is, is take and purposely create a fine and coarse sample. And then we put it into the segregation tester and then get the reflectance spectra, calculate the, uh, the concentration of fines and coarse. And if we have other information about the, fine, the particle size of the fines and coarse, we can then take that information and select the various different size particle size bins that we want to look at and plot those as a function of dimensionless radius uh, on, the, uh, on the pile. Remember that zero is at the top of the pile and one is the, at the bottom of the pile. So we can, we can get, uh, using NIR and spectral methods, we can get the concentration by component or we can get a concentration by particle size. And that's very helpful when we're trying to understand segregation. Now, we have to also get some information about the, the bulk material. So what do we need? We need to measure the bulk strength of the material. And uh, the reason that we need to do that is because there's a general concept that if I increase the cohesive nature of the material, I will decrease segregation. But the problem is that it doesn't decrease the various different mechanisms at all the same rate. So I really need to understand the bulk strength of the material. I definitely need to understand the wall friction angle of the material because when I put it into a process vessel, that wall friction angle is going to determine the velocities that are in that, that vessel. And then I'll need to know the bulk density because I need to know stresses. And in some cases, I'll need to know the, how permeable the material is because it could carry air with it. And sometimes that causes the segregation. So when we're talking about the bulk strength of the material, unfortunately, when we're talking about segregation, we're talking about surfaces. We're talking about a pile formation. We're talking about dye formation in a pharmaceutical. We're talking about the pharmaceutical bins. And so the stresses that we need to measure the strength at are on the order of 100 pascals to at most 500 pascals. And so we need to be able to measure the, the strength under those conditions. If we're talking about wall friction, we also have to measure the, the wall friction angle at those very low stress values. And that gets us what uh, angle of a, a conical hopper would cause flow along the walls, for example. And we're talking about typically stresses in this order of ma magnitude down in the very, very low end, which uh, usually control things in, in this case. <clears throat> so we need that information in order to understand the velocities. This is very, uh, this is a very typical plot. If, if you know the wall friction angle and you know the conical uh, hopper angle, you can, you can go ahead and uh, plot it on this graph and you can determine whether or not you have material that flows in funnel flow or flows in mass flow. And you'll, you'll have some practitioners say that uh, what you wanna have is you wanna have mass flow and that will solve all segregation issues that's not quite the full picture because what it does, it, it, that particular assumption assumes that we don't know the velocity profile. And sometimes we get mass flow, but we have very steep velocity profiles, almost as steep as funnel flow. So when we're dealing with trying to solve a segregation issue, it's all about velocity control rather than am I in funnel flow or mass flow? And if I'm in mass flow, then I'm, then I'm safe. And we'll talk about that. These are some velocity profiles. They're all mass flow velocity profiles. You, see, you can see that even in the steepest velocity profile, we still have some flow along the, along the wall. Zero is at the center and one is at the, at the wall. 
but you can see they vary as a function of the friction angle that is in the material, and this is for a 20 degree bend. So we've got the wall friction angle determines the velocity profile in a piece of process equipment. Now, if we take a look at process equipment, you've got uh, various different pieces of process equipment. You have uh, tote pins, you've got uh, tablet presses, which are a combination of various different pieces of process equipment, including a small surge hopper. You have blenders, you have uh, surge bins that we put the material into. Anytime that you have a wide spot in the line, you have the potential for segregation to occur. Now, in some product, uh, processes, what we do is we fill the piece of process equipment, could be a bag, could be a tote, could be a, a lot of other things, and then we discharge that completely. That is a very dangerous situation for, for segregation because even if you have a little bit of segregation, you can get yourself into uh, trouble. In other instances, what we have is we, we tend to work in a, a, a continuous mode or operation and we discharge, we discharge as we fill. And so the segregation is usually much less in that. We're gonna deal with both and how to deal with that and calculate that so that you can understand what that might mean in your process. There are some other instances, and these are fairly common, where we don't form the pile in the center of the process vessel. Um, in this case, this is a special feeder that, uh, that controls the, the volume or the weight of the material that flows into a package, but the gears and all of the stuff that drive this is in the center of the hopper, so you can't feed it from the center. What you have to do is feed that from the side, and so you form a pile, but it forms a pile across the entire vessel, and then you've got a, a discharge in a, in a typical mass flow um, a manner or funnel flow manner. The question is, what does that cause in terms of segregation? Is that good or bad, and where should I put the uh, feed point? The other thing is, what's the best configuration to use uh, in there? I've got several options. I can go with a, a traditional conical hopper. I can put some sort of distribution at the top of my system to try to spread the things out and decrease the, the segregation. Could go with a, 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 a cone and cone. And so we'll talk about the effects of all of these things and why some are good and some are bad. In order to understand a segregation prob problem, what we need to do is break it into three different problems to be solved. First, I need to fill a container and understand the segregation that arises by that filling and then understand the segregation that arises as I empty that container. Um, sometimes we're interested in segregation that happens from as a, tra a material transfers from one container to another and then sometimes we're interested in smoothing out concentrations uh, on a single pass mode as we pass material through a particular container. Uh, that material may be segregated, but the question is, does it, is, does it, is it segregated once it comes out of the container such that it's gonna cause some problems in my process? What do we need? Well, we need to know the segregation propensity. We need to know the segregation profile as a function of radial and axial position in the equipment. And we get that by, uh, by doing some tests. We also need to know the flow properties. We need to compute the solids velocities in the equipment, and we need to compute the stress levels in, in the equipment. When you're dealing with a segregation issue, it is a global issue. So you have to take a look at the entire system. Uh, you have to start at the very, very top of it, right after the mixer, and ask the question, what wide spots do I have in the line? Is it possible for segregation to occur there? And if it is, how bad is it? And how does it present itself in terms of the time sequence? So we need a model to understand flow through the equipment that may induce that. And in some cases, and we'll point out some of these things, in some cases, we might even need to know what causes the segregation in the first place, because there are some things that can, that can cause that grief. 
So this is a uh, just an example of a, a, a pharmaceutical material. And what you're seeing here in the green is the active in that. And you can see that it varies as a function of position uh, uh, along the pile. And it's a fairly significant uh, variation uh, that, that you have. It goes from 8 to 12%, which is a little bit more than pharmaceutical people would like to have. So now, what we need to know is, uh, what are the velocities? And I'm going to put up three slides. Uh, these will be available, so you can, you can go through them. But I just want you to get your feel. This comes from the equation of motion. We simply take, and instead of relating velocities to uh, viscosities and velocity gradients and things like that, we relate the stress to each other. And what we're interested in is this little uh, value here, omega because that controls the velocity that we have through the bin. If we know omega, we can calculate the velocity that we have in a piece of, of process equipment as it drains. And that's critical to understanding segregation. You can see in this example that as the friction angle changes from five degrees to 25 degrees, the steepness of that velocity profile changes. Even at 25 degrees, we still have a little bit of flow at the walls, but it is extremely steep, very, very fast flow in the center and a slow flow at the, at the walls. As if we have a much uh, smaller friction angle, then we have a much flatter velocity profile and that it helps with, uh, with segregation. Now that's not the entire issue because in the funnel flow we have an active flow channel and it, it occurs and it expands at some angle that we can calculate but at the top of that active flow channel we have with a free-flowing material a cascade action as it flows into that active flow channel so we actually have two things we have to worry about we have to worry about the flow profile in the active flow channel and we have to worry about the velocity profile that we get from a cascade action as it flows into and sloughs into that active flow, flow profile. We can put the, those two together and calculate the, uh, the overall velocities that come through a bin in funnel flow and in mass flow. And uh, what we'll do is we'll divide the bin or the container into volumes that have uh, equal volume. We will place a cluster. Now this is a placeholder at spatial coordinates within each, each of those volume zones. And then we're gonna assign a concentration of whatever the active is or whatever uh, component they're interested in based on the segregation tests. And then we will move that cluster based on the velocities that we calculated from the discharge. So and then what we'll do is we simply look at the bottom of the, of, the, of the hopper and ask the question, when did that cluster come out? And, uh, and what concentration does it have? And then we can calculate the concentration as a function of time leaving that piece of equipment. We have to define acceptable limits on content uniformity. And, and then we'll ask the, that, the question, does the concentration leaving that hopper does it fall within that limit or outside of that limit? And then we have a segregation measure, measurement that is process dependent. So we'll take a look at various different time sequence that comes out of that. Uh, we will then take a look at the, at the parts of this that are within the specifications. And we'll say, well, this one is within the specification. This, this one in the red is within the specification. 30% of the time. So that gets a 30% uh, segregation index. Some of these others may be in specification 80% of the time or 90% of the time. 100% would be a perfect operation. So we'll take a look at this being good material and then ask the question, how much of that is good material? And you can see that in a cone, this is the material flowing through the cone, what you see in the dotted a uh, red line is the funnel flow, and you can see that it's it's not good for a fair part of the part of the time. 
But if you look at uh, the mass flow, and this one in the yellow is what the traditional mass flow cone would give you. You can also see that is that is that is uh, not so good part of the time. If you change the slope angle, then you get into situations where you're good different parts of the time. And so we can take a look at that as a, as a overall. What you're looking at here is what happens in a typical conical hopper with a segregation profile that's linear. This again is the wall friction angle, hopper angle. And this, where they bunch up, this would be the mass flow line. This would be funnel flow on this side and mass flow in this side. What you see here is the segregation index. And what you'd like to have is something that is close to one. If you're operating close to the mass flow line, then in this particular case, you could have a, a segregation index of 0.7, maybe 0.75 or 0.8, but that's the best that you're gonna get in terms of that. You'd have to make this, the hopper steeper, the conical hopper steeper in order to get up to the 90% uh, good operation where 90% of the material would be uh, in spec during a complete operation mode a fill than an empty mode. If we just look at the, varying the conical hopper, you can see that uh, 25 uh, degrees is, is very poor segregation index. As we decrease the uh, hopper angle and make it steeper and steeper and steeper, you can see that we increase the segregation index, 100% being uh, the best that we can do. But even, you know, even with that, we can only go to about 87% in this particular case, <clears throat> which may or may not be good enough for what we want to do. So let's talk about the cone and cone and some advantages that it might have over uh, when we deal with segregation. We again have a velocity in the inner cone that is the typical velocity that you see in, in cones, but we also have a velocity in the outer cone that we can calculate. And that's shown here. Now, if we adjust the areas of the inner cone to the outer cone, we can get a velocity profile that looks like this, where it's mostly uniform, or we can get a velocity profile where we have a very fast velocity at the, uh, in the inner cone and a slow velocity at the, uh, at the outer cone. So we get that overall profile. Which one's the best? So we're gonna take a look at velocity ratio and go ahead and plot the segregation a content uniformity is coming out of that. You can see we've got the funnel flow, and that's bad. We've got a velocity ratio of 1.5, so it's 1.5 times faster in, in the center than on the, than on the outside. And you can see that is also bad. We've got a velocity ratio of uh, 1.2, and you can see that's bad, but it's getting a little bit better. When we get down to a velocity ratio of about 0.9, what you're looking at is the purple line, and you can see that uh, it is almost all good material. It's just a very, very little bit at the very end is out of spec. And so if you plot that as a function of velocity ratio, what you find out is that if I can make that a uniform and a little bit slower in the center, that actually helps with the segregation profile and gives me a segregation index, which is of 100% coming out of that particular geometry. So the best configuration for, if you can do it, would be a cone and cone to use as the feed hopper. But just a word of caution, this depends on the segregation pattern and you really ought to design for that. But if you've got, if you got a choice, what you wanna do is iron out that and, and flatten out that, uh, that velocity so that you get a nice uniform drawdown when you have a radial segregation problem. One of the things that people do is they say, well, let's distribute, create a, a distribution chute at the top of this and distribute so we get lots of little piles and we'll form lots of little piles, but that should help with the segregation. And so we wanted to take a look at and see how that, uh, that helped. We do the same sort of thing. We form lots of little piles there. We, we calculate uh, the segregation profile, put that into the geometry. And, and this is the case in a mass flow bin 
with and without the piles that form. And you can see that in the mass flow bin with without the piles that form is the blue line. In the mass flow bin with the piles that form, it is the red line. And you look and find out how much is act actually outside the content uniformity range. And you actually get a little bit of help from that, but it's 83 versus 81. So that's in a mass flow bin. In a funnel flow bin, um, this is the profile without di the distributor at the top, and you can see that's pretty bad. We get a segregation index of about 33%. If we put the distribution at the top and, and distribute those piles and then discharge, we can increase that segregation index up to 88%, which is very good. And that, that is a benefit. Has a better benefit, the distribu <coughs> distributing at the top has a better benefit in many cases in a funnel flow bin than it has in a mass flow bin, although in a mass flow bin, it will also benefit. And it will depend on the uh, velocity profile in that mass flow bin is how much benefit you actually get. The other thing that we wanted to take a look at is, well, what happens if we have to, if we have to form a pile on the side? What does that do? And so we did the same sort of thing. We took a look at the segregation profile. We then took a look at the velocities there and we imposed the segregation profile on the bin. And what you're looking at here is various different discharge conditions from, the mass, from this mass flow bin um, as a function of where the input is. Uh, what is the offset from the center where the input is? And you can see that uh, <clears throat> if you're just near the center, that's not a good thing. You're out of spec a fair amount of time. That's this yellow line. <clears throat> but if you're if you're close to where this uh, one 160 millimeters of offset in the in the feeder, everything is pretty close to within the acceptable limits. And if we plot that as a function of the offset from the center, where zero is no offset from the center, what you can see is that there's an optimal position, filling position that will minimize the segregation. So even though this is not an ideal bin and doesn't flow very well in, in, in a complete mass flow, has a very steep velocity profile across it, we can still mitigate some of the segregation by where we put the, the charge point in that piece of process equipment. Now, let's go to another uh, mode of operation. Sometimes we're not in a mode of, of filling and then completely emptying. What we're in the mode of is continuous operation or semi-batch mode of operation. And in that case, what we're interested in is if material that comes in segregated goes and passes through this, what is the concentration profile as it exits that particular piece of equipment? And so you can take the velocity profiles and you can calculate from those velocity profiles a residence time distribution. And what you see here is a residence time distribution in this case for the cone and cone and uh, it distributes the, the material. When you do this, you numerically put a layer at the top of, and then you follow that layer and then count the markers that come out of the, uh, of the bin or hopper. You could do this experimentally, but it's a little bit easier to do it from a, a calculation point of view. So now, when we vary the velocity profiles, we vary the residence time distribution function we start off with a input concentration, and that's shown in the, in the blue line. And as we vary the residence time distribution function, we calculate the concentration coming out, and that's showing in the red line. And you can see that there's a reduction in the variation between the blue variables that are coming in and the red variables that are going out, and that's good. The question is, is it enough? And so in this case, we calculated that for us to be within a content uni uniformity for this particular segregation pattern, we had to be at a variance reduction factor of 30%. That is, we had to reduce 
the variation down to 30% of what it was before. And so you take a look at how many cycles, bin cycles, will do that. And this would be the variation, the variation over the size of the container that, we're, that we have to have the velocity profile in. And in this case, uh, if we had the uh, piece of equipment as large as the variation, we'd be doing pretty good. Ideally, we'd like to have the piece of equipment to be, uh, or the, we'd have to ha like to have four variations within the size of that piece of equipment, and then we do very, very good. So what does that mean? What that means is that if we have a large bin, and below that we put a small bin that is designed to, to mix, then we're working here. And the question is, what size does this bin have to be? If we've got the reverse of that, and we've got a small bin that we're charging, maybe it's a super shack, and we're putting that into a, a, a piece of equipment, then we can get various different uh, fluctuations in that. We could have up to four, five, or six volumes or, or fluctuations within the volume that's here, and that's a good thing. So it, it gives you an idea of where you're at on the, on the variation that comes out of there. And uh, in some cases, some people are working in this mode where they've got a, a small super, super sack and they're charging a, a surge hopper. And in that case, you don't need a, a whole lot of velocity profile, but you do need some in order to mix uh, because this volume that is actually segregated and coming in segregated is not very large. The re if the reverse is true, then you do need a significant volume to mix. Now, sometimes we need to know what the segregation mechanism is. And you can see that there are various diff different mechanisms. You can have fine particles that sift down through the matrix, of course, and that's one mechanism. You could have the fact that you've got different size or shape particles and they form different repose angles and that causes a, a segregation. You could have fines that are fine enough to be carried by air currents, falls into the, the bin, releases the air and the fines are carried down the, down the pile. All of those can give you an understanding of what causes the segregation to occur but recognize that they're additive. The effects of those are additive in terms of what they do for the, for the dispersion of the material. Why is that important? Well, when, we've, when we feed a material into a bin, some, sometimes we put it in, in and through various different feeders. And the action of the feeder itself can cause the, some segregation. This is, a, this is an example of what might happen on a, on a belt. As a belt travels, it uh, comes across an idle where you get some vibration. And so if the material is, si is sensitive to sifting, then it, you can form a top to bottom segregation profile. If it is not sensitive to sifting, but it's sensitive to things like angry pose, <clears throat> then you may form a profile on the belt where you've got the fines in the center and the course on the outside. In the sifting case, you've got the fines in the bottom and the course on the top. Now, when that belt comes into a piece of process equipment, you'll get a, and if it's segregated there, you may get fines that deposit on the closer side and course deposits on the, on the farther side. So the segregation pattern itself into the bin fall, is dependent on what causes the segregation in the first place. In addition to that, as you discharge it into the bin, you form a pile. And when you form a pile, you, you get into the situation where you get segregation because of the pile formation. You can see, in this case, we'll focus on the blue. This is blue sand here. Uh, very large segregation profile that, uh, from the top of the pile to the bottom of the pile. Now, that's important, especially when you have a situation where you have pant leg hoppers. So if we take a look at the segregation profile in, in, this, in this bin, what we'll do is here's the charge point. Here's the point that we're interested in. 
And then we will use the segregation profile to get the segregation intensity number or concentration at that particular uh, point in the bin, looking down from the top. When we do that, this is the segregation profile that we can get in, the, uh, in that particular pant leg hopper filled with the belt conveyor. Depending on whether or not the, the material is sensitive to sifting or angle repose, that pattern will change. And you can see how that changes. Now, that becomes a problem when you're trying to feed multiple outlets and get the same material in each one of those packages down the, down the system. The belt entry comes from this direction here, but you can see that over in this region right in here, we have a very high concentration of the blue. And in this region right here, we have a, a low concentration of the blue. What that means is in this outlet right in here, we're going to have a high concentration of blue. And in this outlet right here, we're gonna have a low concentration of blue. If we had multiple, uh, if we had eight outlets, then the situation be, would be the same. In this outlet, it would be on average 87% blue. And in this outlet, it would be on average 67% blue. And so in this case, distribution of the material coming into the system is absolutely critical. And we, we would need to add a distribution uh, chute to that particular piece of equipment to avoid the segregation. Let's talk about what, what we've talked about here. Segregation is a problem. It requires a measurement and, uh, of a segregation potential to predict that. We need in that measurement to, to know what the segregation pattern is and the magnitude of the variation. We might need to determine the cause depending on the type of, si of system that we have. We'll need to absolutely know the flow properties of the bulk material. We need to know that at, at low consolidation pressures typically. We can then use radial stress approximations to find velocities in, in equipment. And then you, we can use particle tracking or cluster tracking techniques to estimate the segregation that comes out of the system. And that, and that gets us the, what will effectively help us understand if you fill the container, what segregation comes out of the container as a function of discharge. We can also use the radial stress theory to calculate the resonance time distribution. And from the time distribution, we can calculate the segregation that might happen in a continuous system and ask the question, what type of velocity profile do we need that system to have in order to get rid of the segregation? And that's the uh, just a synopsis of, of a topic of segregation. There is much more to this topic, but uh, but uh, we don't have time in this in this uh, venue to to discuss it. Thank you very much, uh, Kerry, for this uh, quite wide uh, overview on the on a on a complex topic actually. And uh, I want to apologize uh, for uh, being late uh, according to initial schedules for uh, all the speakers and, and the attendees, but also it's part of the fact that we uh, got uh, a very interesting question. And so the, the, the timing was not uh, very, very strict on that due to my uh, poor control on that. Uh, by the way, um, I have only one question actually on this, but I think that this was a reason at the beginning and, and maybe uh, Kerry answered already during the, uh, the presentation because uh, um, the question is, if there is no profile measured in the pile by the spectral method, still other mechanisms of segregation could induce the particular material to segregate rather than one by only pile formation somehow you address it already, but I don't know if you want to add uh, something. Sure, I'll, I'll address that. So when you, when you form a pile, um, if you take a look at how that pile forms, it, it, uh, you get a free fall of material onto a surface, typically a pile. During that free fall, you couldn't train air. Um, as that material uh, hits that surface, then 
that error is going to leave that material. It's going to travel down the, the pile. Uh, in addition to that, as you form the pile, you can get into sifting. And as you form the pile, you can have differences in angle repose, which is essentially differences in the friction of the two different components. And so they'll travel down the pile at a different rates. You could have other things like bouncing or uh, static electricity charges in there. Pile, once you form a pile, there's lots of mechanisms that occur. And, and so you need to, uh, if you're dealing just with the process, you don't necessarily need to know in that case why the segregation occurs, just that it occurs and the overall pattern is whatever it is. And then we can use that to calculate once we know the velocities. In some cases though, we need to know the reason for the segregation. And, and uh, because we may be having flow into it as caused by a vibration, a vibra vibrating feeder that which causes sifting and, and that sort of thing. Whereas if, it, if we have a material that wasn't sensitive to sifting, it wouldn't make any difference at all. And so sometimes we need to know the cause and sometimes we don't. If we're trying to mitigate the segregation of the product, you have to know the cause. You have to know what to be able to change in order to, uh, to change that material from segregating. And, but that's a totally different topic. Hopefully that helps, uh, helps you understand that, Dio. Thank you, Kerry. Um, so with this, uh, I want to, to thank uh, again uh, uh, all the, the other uh, speakers for, uh, I, I don't know if it is, uh, if, if they want to add something to say some uh, final uh, remark uh, on also other issues uh, um, treated by the, by the other speaker. I don't know if Mike or Jairo want to say something more. Uh, sure. Uh, again, uh, my topic was uh, related to caking. Um, uh, it was a short presentation. There is a lot into it. But if you have more questions, and I understand you don't have many questions about it, uh, you, please feel free to contact me. You can just go to our uh, jenniki.com webpage and then you, you find me there or uh, you can just type your question and somebody will, will reach you so uh, it was a pleasure being here today and, uh, and to all the other speakers very interesting uh, uh, topics in the area of, of solids handling so thank you very much thank you Jairo Mike uh, likewise, thanks everybody for, your, for, for turning out and listening. I hope you found it useful. Similarly, if you want to come over to our website at the Wolfson Centre, I'll give you the same plug that uh, Gyro just did. Uh, you know, come, come and have a look. There's lots of resources there. Um, I think the key thing really is just to make sure that when you're dealing with bulk solids, you familiarise yourself with some of the issues and make sure that um, you don't uh, put choice and design of equipment into suppliers that don't have the necessary expertise. Okay, thank you. So with that, uh, I want to thank all the attendees for the attention and the patience and in part the final uh, thank is uh, for sure for Martin Pu for organizing all this stuff and uh, uh, the assistance also by Ines uh, and Willy for the technical uh, and the organization. With this, I, I would like to uh, say goodbye to everybody and uh, stay in touch with this uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, initiative of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering. Thank you, Jago. My pleasure. Bye-bye.